Welcome to The Unlist. Today, I want to give you a crash course in the house of Maison Francis Kurjan, also known as MFK. So this is a fragrance house that today people would consider a luxury exclusive tier house, sort of like Creed or Parfum de Marley. At one point though, uh, Maison Francis Kurjan was more of what you might call a traditional niche brand, as in a brand that was focused more on being uh, more artistic, an alternative to the mainstream. Uh, so Maison Francis Kurjan is named after the perfumer who creates all of the fragrances for the house. One Francis Kurjan, a guy who was born in 1969 and rose through the ranks of the perfume world very quickly actually. He was only 25 years old when he released probably his biggest fragrance hit, uh, Le Mal by Jean-Paul Gaultier. Now keep in mind that usually the way it works with these big oil houses when you're a younger perfumer, when you're just fresh out of school like that, you're typically given like bathroom aerosol, stuff like that to work on. But for some reason, uh, his superiors decided to let him apply for a brief that came down the pipe from Jean-Paul Gaultier, who was at that time launching their first men's fragrance, and that fragrance would become Le Mal. So he created a, a formula based on the brief description and submitted it, and somehow he beat out all the senior perfumers who had also applied for that brief to win the contract. His was picked by Gautier himself, and thus suddenly his name was in lights because that fragrance, as you know, sold millions and millions of bottles, and you can still buy it today, even at places like you know, Rite Aid and stuff. So it became a big deal, and suddenly this young perfumer, only 25 years old, was right up there with the big boys, people who were like three times his age, you know, people like Gene Amick and freaking uh, Pierre Bourdon and, you know, uh, Alberto Maria, stuff like that, you know. So this, of course, led to a somewhat of a, um, imposter syndrome for him because he would ultimately develop uh, as a perfumer who was very self-critical of his own work. He's gone on record as saying that when he releases a fragrance and he makes a fragrance for a client and then it gets put in the market, if it gets discontinued and it fails, he takes that personally as a failure on his part to make something that uh, people resonate with, right? Even though it's much, much colder and more corporate than that, he could have made a perfectly good fragrance. It just wasn't, you know, marketed correctly or whatever. It's not always the fragrance's fault. But in, anyway, that's how he takes it. He internalizes it. He takes it personally. So it kind of makes sense that he would ultimately release a more personal brand of niche fragrances that weren't subject to such high commercial expectations, right? And so Maison Francis Curzon, when it came out in 2009, was that creative outlet away from the big oil houses, away from the designer clients and so forth. So he hooked up with a business partner who was Lebanese. He himself is Armenian. so general region uh, so they became friends and this guy's name is Mark Chaya and Mark Chaya brought the funding for the house and then of course a full line of fragrances came out in 2009 when the brand debuted now there's some speculation as to the origin of most of these earlier fragrances all of which are now discontinued but the early fragrances like the Apom line like the Lumiere Noir line like the original uh, Cologne and Absolu Pour Le Matin and Cologne and Absolu Pour Le Soir, those early fragrances. Rumor has it that a lot of those were mods for designer briefs that were not uh, accepted or got so far along the process and were shot down in favor of other mods. So just like Pierre Bourdon, a lot of his fragrances that didn't get accepted, he kept and eventually ended up in the hands of Creed and became Creed Fragrances. Some of the early uh, MFK fragrances feel like they were coulda, shoulda, woulda alternate universe versions of things that did get released. For example, the men's version of Apom smells like it could have been another take on uh, Fleur du Mal by Jean-Paul Gaultier, a fragrance that is, of course, also discontinued and worth a ton of money online. The collectors love that one. And uh, so on and so forth. So that's just rumors. I can't confirm it, but I figured I'd throw it out there for you. So what defines MFK as a house is the rather sort of experimental avant-garde nature of the fragrances. So Francis Kurjan, 
he is a perfumer who is similar in his taste and predilections to someone like Jean-Claude Elena, like Pierre Bourdon. He likes to use synthetics. He likes to play with very abstract accords. And when he does use uh, very lucid, natural notes in perfumery, they are often still comprised of synthetic materials that uh, simulate whatever it is. So his rose notes that are very prominent in some of his fragrances, it's not real rose, or it's very little actual rose. It's built up with synthetics. Same thing with his orange blossom notes that he likes to use. He also is a very big fan of using uh, a lot of materials like cashmere and ethyl maltol and uh, ombretolide and stuff like that, tonalide. He likes to use a lot of these very sort of sheer, clear, transparent, and of course, ambroxan as well. So he's a fan of the chemistry side of perfumery. You're not going to see any MFK fragrances that have patchouli oil or anything in them. It's not going to happen. If there's patchouli at all, it's going to be a fraction, like a fraction distillate kind of deal. So that's just right there. I'm letting you know if you don't like that. If you want more of that Arise de Dor style, more of that uh, Bruno Fazolari style, where there's a lot of naturals being slung around, you probably don't want to go anywhere near MFK. It's not going to be for you. It's very abstract, very synthetic, very avant-garde, very experimental. Okay, It is what it is. So the early fragrances, though, were more about uh, contrasts. So stuff like APOM, which stands for A Piece of Me, for example, that was his signature fragrance that he actually made for himself, is an exercise in clean, narrowly orange blossom wrapped in clean musks that are then overlaid with a dirty, funky sort of civetone kind of uh, Cinerome Atomalis kind of note underneath. So when you smell a palm, it has a very uh, clean, sweet orange blossom note in the opening, but then it gets uh, very thick and rich and almost kind of uh, jicky-like with the way the musk is just kind of like round and thick and heavy and opaque, you know? And it's the way animalic musks work when you mix them with cleaner notes, you know, like the clean floral notes of Jiggy or Mouchoir de Monsieur, you know, and then you have the, the dirty civet, it creates this sort of uh, weird contrasting interplay. And you'd also see that with Lumiere Noir, which uh, is a rose fragrance, but again, it plays around with synthetic musk materials and also some animalic notes. And the men's version of that fragrance in particular is very weird because it has a very heavy dose of Artemisia. And Artemisia and rose together create a very strange tandem. It's just, these are fragrances that regrettably were probably uh, more interesting than what we have now from this brand, but I'll get into that in a second. So the Absolu uh, and Cologne Pour Le Matin were also based around Linden Blossom and Rose, and then they had a, a civet-like quality in the base as well. And then the Absolu and Cologne uh, Pour Le Soir for the evening, you know, uh, Pour Le Matin was for the morning, Pour Le Soir. Those were more uh, gummy, sweet amber, actually similar to the Jean-Paul Gaultier fragrance that uh, Kurjan made called Gaultier II, similar to that with the gummy amber, except that the MFK fragrance, the Absolu and Cologne, had more of uh, like a funky sort of uh, a cumin note in there, a body sweat kind of note. So again, it's like I said, it's contrasts, playing with contrasts. And then once we get into the 2010s, we see more of what we consider the modern MFK style emerge, but not right away. So we would see the Aqua series come out, which these were all ex uh, exercises in very sheer sort of aquatic synthetic, uh, a lot of floral notes, ambroxan. Then we would see uh, Amaris, the Amaris line. And the Amaris line was the first real true sign of things to come, okay, the shape of things to come, to quote H.G. Uh, um, Wells. But Amaris was really the shape of things to come because it was a fully mainstream-minded commercial fragrance line. And the men's version of that fragrance line smells almost like a very highbrow take on Gucci Guilty. Now, I like Gucci Guilty. I know some of you guys don't, but... If you took Gucci Guilty and made it more expensive and less sweet and just more artistic and just more effort put into it, it feels like, 
You know, not that Jacques Cousley didn't put a lot of effort into Gucci Gilles, let's not get it twisted. He did, but imagine if he was given even more opportunity to really take it in a strange new direction. That's kind of what Amaris smells like to me, the men's version. It has a, co a coffee and coconut contrast to it, just so weird. So very nice fragrance, but a very commercial, you know? And then from there, we would see the whole luxury thing start to gradually replace the niche thing. I don't know if this was Mark Chaya pushing Francis Kurjan in a more money-minded direction because they want to make money, they want to be successful, they want to pay the bills. I don't know what the reason for it was. It could also be because Francis Kurjan himself was no longer working with uh, designer houses as much. So with him no longer making commercial fragrances as much as he once did, maybe those commercial ideas were bubbling up and manifesting in his own line. I wasn't a fly on the wall there, I can't tell you, I'm just taking shots at it. But for whatever reason, we saw a transition between like 2012 and 2015. We would see the Aqualine get stronger versions of themselves, the Forte fragrances. We would see the Oud range come out, which was like uh, appeasing the luxury segment because Oud was like, you know, this big deal. So we would see Oud and then Oud Satin Mood, Oud Cashmere Mood, all that stuff. Um, and these fragrances are not really any real Oud at all. I mean, they claim to contain real Oud, but if you've smelled real Oud, you know they don't. They're not bad, but for what they are, I feel like they're overpriced and they're underwhelming. So those are the M MFK Ouds are not really to my taste, but if you guys like them, that's okay. Then the big one happened, you know, and I don't need to tell you, some of you guys already know, but Baccarat Rouge 540. That would become the Aventus, effectively, for this, this brand. The big moneymaker, the big killer app, so to speak, the one that would just set the whole thing on fire. And it was kind of an accident because around the period where Baccarat Rouge 540 came into being, Maison Francis Curjean had become sort of an exclusive brand. They were becoming more luxury oriented anyway. So then they started to make uh, department store exclusives for different high-end department stores in different parts of the world. So department store in Moscow got sealed the gum. Department store in France got Le Beau Parfum. Department store in the United States, I think it was Bergdorf Goodman, got 754. And then, of course, the uh, legendary glass maker, chandelier crystal maker, um, Baccarat, they received Rouge 540. And it was released originally not as an MFK fragrance. It was released originally as a Baccarat fragrance called Baccarat pause baccarat rouge 540 but the hype was real with that fragrance and eventually mfk kind of went and said hey can we re-release this as our fragrance and like pay you a royalty or something because this is people really like this so that happened and then what was baccarat rouge 540 became mfk baccarat rouge 540 or BR540 as all the bros call it, right? So that fragrance would become stupid popular and it would get a stupid number of imitators and an even more stupid number of outright clones. It was like an Armoff version of that fragrance now. So that just goes to show you how big of a deal it would become. And it was a wholly synthetic fragrance, very experimental, no natural materials at all in it. And it would kind of set the pace for what MFK would fully transition to the following year in 2016 when they would finally do uh, Michelangelo Batio and you know give the keys to the Lamborghini over to someone else and they would sell to LVMH and then LVMH would buy MFK and include them in their portfolio of other luxury brands like Edition de Parfum, Frederick Mall. And then once that would happen, then all of the old stuff got discontinued or reorchestrated and replaced so Lumiere Noir went bye-bye, both of those. Apom went bye-bye, both of those. The uh, Absolute and Cologne, Pour Le Montin and Pour Le Soir, would, all four of them would be discontinued and replaced with two new fragrances that were basically more commercialized versions. So we would see the Linden Blossom and the uh, 
the rose focus of uh, the mati fragrances become a petit mati or a small morning, right? And then we would see the Cologne Absolute Pour the Soir with the gummy amber and the, uh, the cumin. That would be reorchestrated into a grand soir. And those, that fragrance doesn't have the cumin. So basically, just take the animalics out of both of those fragrances and make them more commercial, more mass appealing, and then bump them up to, um, to Eau de Parfum. And then that you'd have Petit Matin and Grand Soir. We would also see the uh, aqua fragrances also get yet another new line of flankers, Cologne Forte. And then uh, we would also see the gentle fluidity range, which I actually really like the gentle fluidity range. They are basically two fragrances made from the identical selection of materials, but in different ratios. So take the same ingredients, but in different quantities to create two entirely different unrelated fragrances. Gentle fluidity silver, gentle fluidity gold. Now these fragrances, they're not, the, they're not the best fragrances. I'm not gonna tell you that they're masterpieces, but I find the concept fascinating. Two different fragrances made from the same materials in different proportions. That's just cool. Whether you like them or not, that's just cool, okay? But they would get in trouble because politics, da 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 da, and the fact that they were marketed as being gender fluid and marketed as being uh, genderless, and you know, if you're a non binary person, you can wear either one of these if you want to, or you can decide which one's male, which one's female. So, you know, all of the, all of the really like hardcore transphobes and the MAGA guys and the QAnon guys and all of that, the, those basement dwellers would come out of the basement and go, like that and then you know make a big stink we're going to cancel mfk because they're pushing a, they're pushing a queer agenda onto us they're, they're, of course clearly you can see i don't care i have i have less than no than no care for that at all to me it's amusing it's just let me eat some popcorn but if you remove that political controversy away from the gent the gentle fluidity range what you're left with are two uh, commercial. I mean, one's like a juniper, fresh, kind of almost like a Ventus with juniper, and the other one's more like a Grand Swa 2, Electric Swa Alu. So neither one of them are all that great, like I said, but the concept is really cool. The fact that they both have the same materials in different ratios, you know, love it or hate it, it's just fascinating. So you, at least one thing you can say, no matter how commercial that MFK has become, that experimental avant-garde edge is always there. It's always been there because that's just Francis Curzon himself. That's just how he is. So he's, he's never going to do anything that's 100% phoned in, you know. Like Alberto Morias would do a totally phoned in fragrance. MFK can't. It's just not possible, you know. Francis Curzon can't do a totally phoned in fragrance. He's got to put some little twist in there somewhere to make it weird. If it's only a little bit weird, it's still weird, you know, like Lo Mala Rose is an example. That fragrance was originally never meant to be. The A La Rose series was just for women. It was a rose water, very commercial, lychee and rose kind of thing. But then he had been working on a fragrance, I guess, years back for a designer and it was canceled and he was stuck with the formula. So he decided to like refashion it into Lo Mala Rose. So a masculine rose fragrance and it's basically just a rose fragrance with a very dry ambroxan base and it's got a big massive dump of grapefruit on top so it's a grapefruit rose it's almost like if you like a pamplemousse rose from hermes but you wish it was more rose and you wish it was stronger then this is kind of that's what low mala rose is so you probably like it if that's your thing but that's basically it though guys that's maison francis curjon that's mfk in a nutshell Recently, the Bergdorf Goodman scent, the, the 754, was re-released as 724. So they're trying to recapture the magic of BR540, I guess. But you guys know, lightning never strikes twice, usually. So that fragrance has not taken off. 754 hasn't taken off the same way that BR540 did. So nice try, but, you know, no cigar. And that's it. It's a luxury house. Um, very abstract, very synthetic, very experimental. The earlier fragrances were much more interesting, much more challenging. They had animalic musks in them. The later fragrances are much more sheer, much more transparent, more Jean-Claude Elena-esque in, in, in effect, and not as interesting. 
but they're still nice. Whether or not they're worth the price, since their prices have just gone up and up and up and up since they've moved into the luxury space, I will leave that up to you. But it is a bit of a hard sell to ask for you know more than two hundred and fifty dollars in some cases for seventy mil. It's not even two and a half ounces; it's like two point four ounces. So it depends on what you consider to be a value. I like them. I own several of them, but I can't wholeheartedly recommend the range knowing what they go for unless you manage to get a back alley deal or something somewhere. But there you have it, guys. That's MFK. That's Maison Francis Curjon coming right from the brain of Francis Curjon himself. He was a very interesting fellow. These days, he works as the new head perfumer for LVMH's biggest brand, Dior. So as head perfumer for Christian Dior, I don't know what the future will hold for his own brand, whether he'll have time to really do anything or if he's going to offload the work to other perfumers. Who's to say? That story is yet to be written. This is The Unlist, and thanks for watching.